Good evening, and thank you for joining us for tonight's presentation by author-illustrator T. Bowie. I'm Ryan Weber, director of the Kalamazoo Public Library in Kalamazoo, Michigan. As many of you know, Ms. Bowie's presentation is part of a long-standing initiative at KPL known as Reading Together, whereby a single book is selected each year for the community to read and discuss. We believe the shared experience of reading the same book and talking about its themes helps bring people together across boundaries. And while we wish we could be greeting you in person at Chenery Auditorium here in Kalamazoo, as originally planned, the Omicron variant had other plans. Instead, I'm coming to you from the heart of our central library in downtown Kalamazoo. The best we could do, T. Bowie's illustrated memoir about her family's history before, during, and after the Vietnam War is the first graphic novel selected for reading together in its 20-year history. It has been the springboard over the last several months for book discussions in private homes, at libraries, and in faith-based organizations throughout the community. In addition, the library has hosted programs about the graphic novel genre and about several of the book's themes, including writing memoir, displaced persons in Southwest Michigan, intergenerational trauma, and being Asian or Asian American in Kalamazoo. Before I introduce Ms. Bowie, I'd like to acknowledge our many partners who have helped make this year's Reading Together program possible. You can find them all listed at www.readingtogether.us. But I would like to specifically name the Friends of the Kalamazoo Public Library, whose unwavering support of Reading Together has contributed to its long-standing success. As we commemorate this, our 20th year, I'd also like to express our gratitude to the Kalamazoo community for putting its trust in Kalamazoo Public Library each year to choose thought-provoking titles that stimulate rich discussion with each other and provide opportunities to learn more about ourselves and the world around us. T. Bowie was born in Vietnam and came to the United States in 1978 as part of the boat people wave of refugees fleeing Southeast Asia at the end of the Vietnam War. The Best We Could Do has been chosen as a common read title by several educational institutions and public libraries around the country, including San Francisco and Seattle. It's a National Book Critics Circle finalist in autobiography and an Eisner Award finalist in reality-based comics. It made over 30 best of 2017 book lists, including Bill Gates' top five picks. T. Bowie illustrated the picture book, A Different Pond, written by the poet Bao Fi, for which she also won a Caldecott honor. And with her son, Hien, she also co-illustrated the children's book, Chicken of the Sea, written by Pulitzer winner Viet Tan Nguyen. Her short comics can be found online at the Nib, Pen America, and Boom, California. She's currently researching and drawing a work of graphic nonfiction about immigrant detention and deportation to be published by One World Random House. And now, without further ado, it is my privilege to welcome to our virtual Kalamazoo stage, T. Bowie. Hi, everyone. Um, it's really great to be here. Uh, well, I'm here in my house in Berkeley, California, um, virtually with you in Kalamazoo. Um, and perhaps other people are logging on um, from other parts of the country. Um, that is one benefit, I guess, of um, going to virtual. Um, we are nowhere and everywhere at the same time. Um, I am. Uh, much less of a smooth talker than Ryan uh, in that amazing video. Um, what a great introduction. I really want to thank everyone at uh, KPL and this wonderful program. Um, reading together is a great idea. Um, and I'm so thankful that you chose uh, the best we could do. And also you chose a comic book. Um, we call them graphic memoirs, um, I think, to make them sound more serious. But I call it a comic book. Um, I, I am in the same medium 
as um, a superhero comic, but it's a different genre. Um, so that's why I like to tell everybody um, when I'm proselytizing about the amazingness of comics, I say that comics are a medium and not a genre. Um, and uh, I'll just answer two questions right off the bat that I get asked a lot. Why comics? Um, I think in words and pictures. So you're going to see a lot of pictures today. And the other question that I get quite often is, why is the book told in nonlinear chronology? And it's because um, I did not set out to write a memoir of a great person, because that is not me. Um, I'm just an ordinary person who had a lot of questions about um, my origin story, I guess, uh, which makes it very much you know, like a comic book, right? Um, and it is now set 2022, and this book came out in 2017, and I was working on it in the 10 years leading up to that. So I am very much a different person now than um, I was when I was creating it. So part of what I'm going to do with my slides today is try to remember the reasons why I made the book in the first place um, and give you um, a sense of the foundations, the questions, and the angst, because there's a lot of angst, um, that led to the creation of this book before it went off and had all of these amazing adventures that I am not even privy to. Um, so it is with great gratitude and excitement and humility um, and lots of other new stuff that has been happening since I, I made this book um, that I uh, am going to show you some pictures and talk with you. Um, I will do sort of a presentation um, and lead you through some of the background, some of my thoughts, do a tiny bit of a reading for anyone who's not read the book yet. And then um, I will open it up to discussion. Uh, and we have some moderators in the wings who will um, go through the comments and pull your questions for me and put them into a, a place where I can see them. And then I'll try to, I'll do my best to have a conversation with you live. All right, so if we could have the slides, please. Um, I thought I would just do a little show and tell. I'm very excited that the book has been translated and published in um, 10 different places now. Um, one of the most recent ones is this Taiwanese version. And then in the next slide, you'll see the inside cover of um, uh, the mainland China version, which has just come out. Um, there is also a Turkish version that I have not seen yet, um, a South Korean version, uh, Italian, French, Spanish, Portuguese uh, in Brazil. There is not yet a Vietnamese version, although I really, really want there to be. Um, it's just a little bit tricky getting it published in Vietnam with this subject matter um, and the, the history that I'm talking about. So we may have to um, make one for the diaspora. Um, but currently, the book in English is, as far as I understand, available in Vietnam. OK, so this is something that is not in the book. It was something that I wrote for myself when I was, um, I think, a new mother. Or I actually, I might not have been a mother yet. I might have just been in my late 20s, just starting out this project. and 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 stating my intentions. So I'm going to read it here to share with you, but also to ground myself back in the headspace of that angry 20-something-year-old graduate student. Oh, no, I, I'm holding a baby close. So yes, I had just given birth. Uh, so this must be late 2005, early 2006. I hold my baby close and write with confidence that some things are good to forget, like childbirth, and some things should not be forgotten, like history. I collect my family's stories not because we are special or different, but because they are necessary for me to piece together, to remember the reasons why we left Vietnam, why there was so much bloodshed, and why no Vietnam War movie I've ever seen has answered my questions. Um, and this is probably kind of what I looked like at the time. This was the first thought that I had when I held my, my newborn in the hospital. Um, 
<laughs> I was terrified that I was going to drop him. Um, and this is why I start the book uh, with the birth of my son. It was the threshold that I had to cross over into parenthood to develop this whole new kind of empathy for my own parents who I wanted to write about. And I'd been interviewing them and sitting on a, a lot of really, really rich interviews and thoughts, but I didn't feel like I could do them justice until I myself had a baby and became a parent. And then I understood, oh, there is no way you'd mess this up. And I think it also, just as a, from an oral, his, the, the perspective an or, of an oral historian, I think that it also, becoming a parent also taught me to get myself out of the way. Um, before I became a parent, I think I was asking a lot of questions from the vantage point of a child um, and to ask better questions of my parents and really understand who they were before they became my parents. I had to not see myself as the center of the universe anymore or the center of that relationship. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to read just a, a short passage to you just to uh, get us back in the headspace of the book. Have our parents ever looked at us and felt slightly disappointed? Such high hopes, so much possibility to fall short. And though my parents took us far away from the sight of their grief, certain shadows stretched far, casting a gray stillness over our childhood, hinting at a darkness we did not understand, but could always feel. These are the people I come from. Ma, Bo, Lan, Bic, it's pronounced Bic, okay? T, thumb. I figured out more or less how to raise my little family, but it's being both a parent and a child without acting like a child that eludes me. My parents escaped Vietnam on a boat so that their children could grow up in freedom. You'd think I could be more grateful. I am now older than my parents were when they made that incredible journey but I fear that around them, I will always be a child and they a symbol to me, two sides of a chasm full of meaning and resentment. Travis and I moved to California in 2006 to raise our son near family, trading the life we had built and loved in New York for a notion I had in my head of becoming closer to my parents as an adult. I don't know exactly what it looks like but I recognize what it is not. And now I understand proximity and closeness are not the same. How did we get to such a lonely place? We live so close to each other and yet feel so far apart. I keep looking toward the past, tracing our journey in reverse over the ocean, through the war, seeking an origin story that will set everything right. So these are um, the real people, Bo and Ma, um, you know, had to become characters in a, in a story of my telling, but uh, it, it, they, the, those characters are based on the real people, um, warts and all, who raised me. Um, and the stories that I collected that became the book also come from my older siblings and my, my younger brother. Um, they're very much also the storytellers um, and the, the guardians of, of, of these family histories. I owe them a lot. Um, I owe them for their trust in me, um, for allowing me to tell our stories uh, in my own way. Um, I had to decide who were the main characters in the book. And so I had to, to uh, focus on my parents, but my, my, my sisters uh, who are seven and nine years older than me um, held so much more of that history and gave me the perspective of the stories uh, from, the, the, fr from the point of view of children 
which was also important to have because um, a child's experience of, of war, of, you know, leaving your, your country on a boat, uh, of like living in a refugee camp, the child's experiences are very, very different from the adult's experiences. And for me, it was such a gift to have both. Uh, so I did just a lot, a lot of sketches in, in like stacks of notebooks over the years, um, just trying to understand these two, two people. Um, I also did a lot of uh, historical research into what Vietnam looked like, sounded like, felt like, uh, you know, was grappling with at different points in the 20th century. And um, I reconstructed a lot of my own memories that I had blocked out. Um, I learned later that, you know, this is a normal thing um, when bad things happen to you as a kid. Um, you adapt, you sort of cope by uh, blocking them out. And it's not certain memories, it was surprising. Um, it took drawing the spaces that they happened in to, to unlock them. Um, and some of them, you know, had to do were or some 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 of them the scarier memories were actually closely linked with all of the horror movies that my father let us watch as children, um, or actually watched, and we just watched them as a family. And mostly, I was way too young for them. Um, so to get back in the mood to uh, to write the chapter about how terrifying my father was to me when I was little. I rewatched all of the scary movies that we had watched when I was little. Um, and uh, I found that the only one that was actually still scary to me as an adult was Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. Um, and I figured out that formally uh, there were a lot of one point perspectives and like shots of the ceiling, which, you know, is um, how a child sees the, their environment. So I, I used that uh, in, in, in the chapter about being terrified as a kid, and it worked quite well. Um, and it was really cathartic, actually, to draw some of these uh, darker memories that I had sort of tucked away, um, sort of released them for me. And then going back to the notion of, of being a better oral historian and, and, and uh, learning to ask different questions, um, you know, there's something about drawing yourself as a child and then also drawing your parents as children that is very healing. Um, and I'm not afraid to use the word healing because we are talking about trauma. And so, you know, to, to get past the trauma, one has to heal, right? But how is the question? For me, part of that healing was learning to look at my father and also see the little boy in him who had gone through so much and who had never had anybody, anybody. Uh, until he met my mother, really um, care for him in a way that he needed. Um, and so clearly he was a, a very wounded man who was my father. Um, and to forgive him for the ways in which he was not there for me or us as children, um, I had to uh, sort of tend to the needs of the little boy who still lives in him. And that let me... Um, you know, visually juxtapose uh, things that happened in, you know, Vietnam in the 1940s with things that happened in California, in San Diego in the 1970s and 80s. And then that same uh, strategy of visual juxtaposition let me um, juxtapose the A story, which was my family's history with the B story of like what was happening politically uh, in the world um, around them at the time. And so I was able to make connections between, you know, when my father lost his mother and the bombing of Hiroshima. Um, but the connections aren't all, uh, you know, incredibly sad. Many of them, the, 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 same, um, the same putting myself in my parents' shoes and seeing them as children uh, in order to see them more fully also extends to the moments of joy that they told me about. 
um, you know, I uh, I have an MFA in sculpture that I don't really use anymore. And honestly, I think if my mother had let me play more in the dirt when I was a child, I might not have gone into sculpture. I might have figured out that I wanted to tell stories earlier. But um, she was raised, you know, very proper in a very proper family, um, very up, upper, upper middle class, you know. Um, and she talks so... Um, so longingly about the countryside and like this one summer that she got to go uh, live in the countryside with one of the servants families um, and you know I'm very aware of the class uh, class dynamics there um, but basically my mother had you know sort of a an idyllic experience outside of her own social class and I think she got to like get to know a certain side of herself that she um, didn't get to explore otherwise in her normal life. Um, and I really felt that. And it was so, so joyful to like recreate these memories and draw her as a, a little kid playing barefoot in the rice paddies, um, eating on a mat on the floor, lying out under the giant moon. Um, I could picture myself there and uh, I connected with her that way. And then, um, then there's my obsession with water. <laughs> Early on, uh, when I was pitching this book to uh, Abrams Comic Arts, I gave them a very, very loose and poetic outline. And I'm not really sure how they understood what it was I was trying to do, um, but thank goodness they did. Anyway, it had an out. It had like you know about ten chapters, um, and the description of each chapter was not really exactly what happened in each chapter, but how each chapter was going to feel. And there was a little thumbnail image, and then a cryptic sentence using water as a metaphor. And sometimes it was about water being a life giving force. Sometimes it was about water being a life taking force. Sometimes it was about about your vessel being so small, how how would how how would you ever make it? Um, but uh, you know, art is a art. You know, I make art, but it's still a little bit of a mystery to me how it is that we convey these like almost un unintelligible feelings that we have. Um, water water conveys so much for me. Also, the light of, of a place. Um, so it was one entry point into some really heavy, uh, subject matter was to be able to draw, uh, things that were happening on water and think about where the sun was in the sky at the time. And to recreate, um, some of the, the small and tender everyday moments, um, like, my mother, my parents telling me, you know, that they would often go to the movies, but you know, when you're writing, you want to place things in a particular scene. And so, you know, water in the form of rain just puts you really into, you know, a summer evening in Saigon. Um, and uh, just really puts you there, which I think is so important when we tell stories. Okay, so now, uh, now, now we we get to the fun stuff, um, the background. How, did, how does one make a comic book or, or a graphic memoir? Um, if you look closely, this is like a stack of the editing process here. Uh, at the bottom, there's a script. Um, and I don't always work from a script these days, but at the time, because I was working with an editor and I could write a lot faster than I drew, a script was um, really, really helpful to help convey to the editor what was gonna happen in each chapter and what it was gonna look like and to be able to get feedback structurally. And, uh, you know, a lot of the feedback was just more questions about things that I hadn't explained clearly. Um, and then on top of the, uh, the, the typewritten script, you'll see some sketches and those are my thumbnails, um, which I edited several times. Um, for just the layout and for the pacing. Um, and only when I've really like nailed down the, the visual form uh, do I go to final art. Um, and the thumbnail process is really the most painful part to me of making comics. But once in a while, there was a page that just sort of flowed freely uh, from the pencil 
to the paper um, or from my, my brain through the pencil to the paper. And, and these were a couple of my favorites where I felt like, oh, I think I understand how to do comics now. Because I actually did not know how to do comics when I started drawing this book. Um, it was a medium that I had to teach myself how to do. And uh, I learned a lot over the process of, of the 10 years working on it. Um, the editing process uh, was very necessary to, um, you know, really try to figure out how to convey a lot in not very much space. Um, you don't have a lot of room for words in comics. And you also, I was also trying to compress, you know, <laughs> I think four, four or five decades into one book. Um, and so there were certain times when I had to like, you know, play out a scene a few different ways, almost like an actor would or a director would. Um, and it was a bit masochistic when it was a, you know, like a scene of domestic violence like this one. Um, and then there were some really funny ones like these are um, in the editing process. It was like so daunting to edit down like 400 and something pages down to 320 pages that made the final cut. Um, and these are some clippings of like scenes that did not make the cut. I don't even remember what these are from exactly, but um, they are hilarious to me. Um, and I, I kept them just to remind myself of like just the 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 sheer craziness of editing um, a comic book down 20% uh, in one month. Um, the other thing that can happen in editing is like uh, between the thumbnails or the pencils on the final inked page, um, a lot can happen in terms of like pacing out the story, changing the camera angles, um, making sure that the main character is on the page. Um, and these things made a big difference. I owe, um, I owe a lot to uh, my fellow cartoonists and uh, this amazing workshop that I went to in Australia um, called the Comic Art Workshop. And I believe this was, this must have been in 2016 or no, 2015. It was the final uh, rough draft of the best we could do um, that I had other people look at before I went to final art. And it helped me so much. Um, there are emotional parts of the story uh, that were hard to draw. War is just a terrible thing to draw. Um, I think Joe Sacco took some time off from, from drawing war journalism um, after, after he did it for a while. And I completely understand that. For me, I would just jump around to the happier parts, <laughs> to happier scenes in the book anytime I got too overwhelmed. And then other days, um, you know, I just had to let the sadness wash over me. And uh, there were some days that I cried more than I drew, but I think that was part of the process of healing as well. Okay, here's a, uh, a question I get asked a lot. It's about the color. Um, so I used a sort of a rusty reddish orange. Um, I, it wasn't my attention from the very beginning. Um, I had pictured a black and white book, or that's what I had proposed. Um, and really, black and white is the, the cheapest way to print a, a comic. Um, and then part of the way through, I started to get really excited about color. And I asked, could I do some color? Uh, could I maybe do a duotone? And uh, the book designer said, let me explore the uh, cost, and I will get back to you. Um, so. Abrams got back to me and said, you can afford one color. <laughs> so then I had to go through the entire Pantone library and uh, pick out uh, a color that, that would work. I, I tried out three different ones. I actually took the test prints to Australia to the comic art workshop. And uh, my expert cartoonist friends rejected them all, um, which made me have to go back to the drawing board and, and go back through the thousand you know, Pantone options until I settled on this one that uh, reminded me of like the brick, the dust that comes off of bricks uh, on an old wall or um, the color of, of like Kodak photographs from the 1970s and 80s that are starting to fade um, or the afternoon light in San Diego. Um, 
So that's how I ended up with this. It's both nostalgic and warm for me, and it's cheap to print one color in offset printing. And here you can see what it would have looked like without any of that. Um, I hope that folks will ask me about what I'm working on these days. Uh, I'm working on a lot of projects right now. I'm hoping to not take 10 years for the next book, but I don't know. Um, climate change is uh, something that I've been uh, thinking about for some time, and I've been wanting to, to write about it from the... Um, you know, I've been an environmentalist uh, since I was in the eighth grade. I, a lot of people don't know that about me. Um, and I've seen the environmental movement evolve a lot over the years. And one, one thing I'm hoping to help evolve is a more global um, uh, and class conscious uh, uh, um, approach to caring about the environment and caring about things like climate change. So I, I went to Vietnam in 2017 to research climate change in the Mekong Delta, which is in the southwest of Vietnam. And it is an area that has something like 17 million people, probably more now. And it is like the, it's like the, the, the it's like the breadbasket of Vietnam, except that people eat rice. So it's, it's more like the rice bowl <laughs> of Vietnam. Um, it, it produces like half the country's rice, I think. Um, and, and, and other things too. And it is um, becoming uh, not possible to farm there uh, because the uh, salt water from the sea is creeping into the land and, 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 and making it salty, uh, which you cannot farm on. But I, what I read is that um, farmers are starting to adapt by like turning their rice fields into like shrimp farms. And it's just, inc it's, it's really incredible, the adaptation so I wanted to go see and, and draw attention to this because I believe that, you know, as things change, um, the people who are, who, are, who are hit hardest and first are the poorer people of the world, the, the global South. Um, and so I wanted to draw attention to that. But also people in Vietnam are so resilient. They've, they've, they've dealt with so much turmoil over the last century and beyond that they just adapt to this too. Um, so it was actually really hard in my interviews to get people to talk about it in a way um, that I could write about actually. So as I was coming back to the um, US, um, I got uh, pulled into um, drawing attention to another problem that was happening uh, with Vietnamese Americans. Um, they were being rounded up by ICE, uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, um, and locked up in, in, in these like prisons, basically, for detention centers for, um, for immigrants. And many of them had been in the US as long as I have. Uh, and, and here they were being separated from their families, taken away from their work, locked up for indefinite amounts of time with no legal re representation to be deported to a country that they had left as refugees. Um, you know, and at, at the time that I, there was a lawyer from Asian Law Caucus who was tweeting at me to, to help um, draw attention to this. And I had another friend who was uh, also a lawyer and, and was working on a class action lawsuit about it. And I wanted to help, but I didn't know the first thing about how one stops deportation. Uh, but I read really fast. Um, so the more I read, the matter I got. And uh, I started drawing uh, little stories about some of the lead plaintiffs. Um, and then I drew a longer comic about the uh, origins of um, some of the, the, the laws that uh, exist since the 1990s that have created the, the circumstances that lead to refugees then being detained to be deported. And uh, then I asked my publisher if I could switch the topic of my book from uh, climate change in Vietnam to um, immigrant detention and deportation um, with a specific focus on Asian Americans because that's a community that I have access to and because it is not a community that is widely associated with the problem of immigrant det detention and deportation. Um, and then it got bigger uh, as 
it's hard to write about detention and deportation without also writing about prisons and mass incarceration in the US. Um, and we are, you know, we're the leader of the world in, um, uh, in, in, in incarcerating people. Um, and one would think that would make us the safest country in the world, right? Uh, that, that would be the logic, but we're not. Um, so asking the questions and thinking about um, who gets uh, locked up um, actually led me in an indirect way to Greece, um, where there are refugee camps, uh, uh, full swelling, swelling with refugees who are trying to get to Europe. Um, and and they were languishing there. Uh, so I went there to um, interview who was there. And I, I found out that um, I had missed the window where uh, the, the camps were full of folks coming over uh, from Syria. And at the time, uh, the camp was mostly refugees from Afghanistan, actually. Um, here's uh, one of the young men um, who translated a lot for me and who's also a refugee himself. Um, and I interviewed people there, uh, teachers, um, orphans, um, with the help of my best friend from high school, who was herself a refugee from Afghanistan in the early 80s. Um, it was heartbreaking then, and it has been heartbreaking since I've come home to follow the news of, of the Moria refugee camp. Um, it was uh, already full, and then it 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 uh, it received thousands more refugees um, uh, since I left, and then a fire broke out, and the entire camp burned down. So these people were all um, then completely without shelter. It was a lot, um, and uh, I think I'm going to pause on this because it's a lot to to intake, and and maybe. Uh, if we get into some questions about this, we can talk about the current refugee situation in the world. Um, currently, one of my healing things is while I'm working on this detention project, I am also drawing a very, very beautiful uh, children's book. I say beautiful not to talk about my artwork, but to talk about the manuscript that was written by the author, um, Angela Pham, who is a debut uh, children's book author from Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and this book, we're just finishing it now and uh, it should come out next year. It's called Finding Papa. And it's about a little girl and her mother who uh, leave Vietnam um, by boat in, in search of her father. So um, I think I'll end with this uh, quote from one of my, from one of, the greatest, you know, authors there of our time, who did one of the greatest TED Talks that you should definitely watch called this, The Danger of a Single Story. She says, many stories matter. Stories have been used to dispossess and to malign, but stories can also be used to empower and to humanize. Stories can break the dignity of a people, but stories can also repair that broken dignity. Um, this is something that I hang on to now that I am no longer a public school teacher. Um, I cannot maintain being an activist full time. I am a storyteller and that is uh, something that fills me with guilt, I think as an immigrant and a refugee, um, but it also like fills me with so much joy and gratitude that this is what I get to do now for a living. So, um, I'm gonna stop talking at you and look over um, to the comments section um, with my moderator's help and start incorporating some of your questions into what I talk about today. Um, if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, you can also post your questions on those platforms and there are uh, many elves collecting your questions from all the different platforms.
there are any fans of Jungian psychology out there, I really love Jungian archetypes and symbols. Um, water is a um, huge symbol for the unconscious, the collective unconscious, I think that I was trying to tap when I was uh, recreating memories of you know lives lived before I was born. Um, what did I find the most rewarding uh, about creating the book? Um, you know, it's very, it's very easy to criticize. Uh, it's very difficult to make things. Um, I am very good at critiquing. Um, this is what going to school, you know, going to graduate school teaches you how to do very well is like to read texts that are out there and to find the problems with them, right? Um, but just like becoming a parent, like making a thing is like terrifying because you're gonna get it wrong, you know? And then other people will read your stuff and like pick it apart. Um, and I think that paralyzed me for a long time, the thought that I could like do further violence to uh, people whose stories had, al had already been, you know, maligned and and told badly through so many bad Vietnam War movies movies already. I didn't want to do them further violence. But I think it was um, having a child, having a baby, like literally the, the giving birth um, that taught me, like there's no going backwards. Like the baby cannot go back. The baby has to come out. And so I, I took that to heart about the book and I, I just forced myself to go. And I can't even really look at the book anymore um, without cringing because, you know, I was teaching myself how to do a lot of things uh, with the medium and there are things that I would do differently now, but I take it as a time capsule of what I was able to do um, at that point in time. And I think that was the most rewarding part was just getting it out. And now it's out there having a life of its own. Um, someone asked me about panels. Uh, how did I, how did I talk about, or how, how did I, make the decision to arrange the panels. You know, it's all about communication and, and trying to create this garden path for the reader to walk through. I had certain rules for myself, you know, um, there were certain words that I would not allow myself to use. Cause I, I also have, in addition to art, I also have a legal studies and a political science background. And I I can use all the words, all the isms, uh, you know, um, all, the, all the words of analysis, but I think to create a, a pleasurable reading experience, which is also really important to me. I had to not use those words because they become jargon that just is noise in your ear and you don't feel them in the same way that you feel an individual's experience. If you know them and you love them, you just feel them in a different way. So, um, you know, there, if there's a chapter about displacement or, um, uh, loss I, I i my rule was i could not use those words i had to create a reading experience for you the reader um, at the end of which hopefully that concept would just appear to you um comics definitely inspired me um we'll start with the 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 greats, um, the intimidating ones were Mouse by Art Spiegelman and uh, Persepolis by Marjan Satrapi. Um, they're both just amazing. And, um, you know, they, they, they strike that balance between the present moment of the narrator trying to figure out the, the story um, and dealing with intergenerational conflict and love. Um, and then, you know, going back in time and recreating memories. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, one of my first mentors was Craig Thompson, the author of Blankets, um, and the, actually went to, to study with him for, for a month-long residency at the Atlantic Center for the Arts. Um, and that was where I met uh, really amazing folks like Jake Wyatt, who later drew, um, you know, was one of the artists for Ms. Marvel, um, Pat Grant, who's an amazing cartoonist in um, Australia, um, I learned uh, Sam Alden, who uh, some of you might know from um, his books or working on Adventure Time, um, Sarah Joan Mukhtar, uh, you know, folks taught me a lot about making comics um, and uh, 
it, it's just a whole beautiful language and a whole beautiful art art community um, that's very lowbrow still and humble and and I love them. Um, oh, okay. Uh, let's see. What other books about Vietnam and the Im immigrant experience would I recommend? Um, gosh, there are so many, but let me just pull up a couple. If you are interested in the history of Vietnam, um, I really, really recommend that you read The Mountain Sing by Nguyen Phan Quay Mai, who um, writes about the same decades that I do, but really goes in depth about the uh, the famine, which she calls the Great Hunger, and um, the effect of the war on the North, which is you know, an experience that I do not have access to. And I've always felt that like, being a child of the diaspora and, and of South Vietnam, I feel like I'm um, the child of divorced parents who won't talk to each other, right? Because that, that was a civil war as well as a proxy war that the US was over involved in. So the civil war aspect of it makes it so that I don't have access to certain things. Uh, you know, Vietnam won't publish my book yet. So it is really, really important, I think, that um, a book like The Mountain Sing exists in English for you to read so that you can get a more complete picture of those decades. Um, and then for another refugee uh, experience, um, this is a book that I'm reading right now uh, by Eric Nguyen called Things We Lost to the Water. And it's fiction, um, but I'm reading it so that I can learn about New Orleans, which is a place that I'm obsessed with right now. Um, and it's it's just gorgeous. I'm reading it very slowly so I can savor it. Um, okay. Uh, how do my family members feel about my book and the success of my book? You know, um, I'm very lucky that my parents are both talkers. I, I've learned from you know going on book tour and talking with other Vietnamese American, uh, you know, younger generation folks. It, I've learned that not everybody talks. Not a, not everybody has parents who talk about things. And so I'm very lucky that um, my my parents were willing to <laughs> share with me their experiences because immigration is. is is this weird experience where you come to the US and then like there's this rupture, you know, and a lot of people leave everything behind, including their stories. And there's no way for the younger generation to access that unless somebody lets them in on the stories. Um, so they were very much collaborators, my parents. I showed them early drafts of the chapters. They you know, really in order to give them veto power over anything they didn't want me to say, but they ended up actually just remembering more stuff because I was like drawing what they had talked about. And then they would go, oh, actually, you know, and then I would have to edit in more detail. Um, so I think they were really happy when it came out because it was sort of their their baby too. Um, I think that they're proud of me. They're, I mean, they'll never tell me. You'll probably need to talk to them yourself and then they'll tell you what they really think. But that's kind of how communication works in, in the family. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, the book title, the book title, The Best We Could Do, um, I think I said this in the introduction of the book, but you know, it used to be called The Refugee Reflex, which was always an ugly title that I knew wasn't the right one. But it was also when I was um, rearranging my life in real life to um, in include my, my aging parents that I realized that the book, in addition to being about refugees and Vietnam and the Vietnam War, was also just about parents and children. Um, and then that's when the best we could do just came to me. Um, but again, you know, my rules for writing being what they are, um, but the one time it's used as a phrase in the book, it's actually in a really sad, uh, instance of doctors telling my mother after her firstborn has died, uh, that they did the best they could do. And for me, that's, that's a nod to the experience of being the child of survivors. It's bittersweet. Um, Someone has to tell the story that way. If this, if the same story had been told by my mother, I think it would have gone something like, you know, there was a terrible war, we escaped, um, 
and then we came to the US and then the children grew up to be amazing people <laughs> or something like that, you know? Um, it, so I think it had to be told from the point of view of the second generation um, that also has questions about, well, what if the best you could do wasn't good enough, you know? And what does that even mean to say that? Um, Let's see. Did the seas rising turn into Nowhere Land? Are they two separate books? They are not published yet. Nowhere Land is is currently uh, it's in my head. Um, I've been researching it for some time. I've got stacks and stacks of notebooks. Um, right now, I'm in the distillation process and the writing process. Um, and the sea is rising. May be morphing into um, instead of a nonfiction book, it may turn into a science fiction collection of short stories, because um, I think there are aspects of climate change that um, are like, climate change is like actually like quite wonky when you, um, when you really learn about it. Um, and it's not all the, the, the sort of sexy, flashy images that you see in the news. And so I'm trying to figure out a way to convey the urgency of addressing it. Um, and I think that science fiction might help me do that. If I just project maybe 50 years into the future in all of the places that I want to write about, that might help people see what's happening now. Um, and so I hope... I, yes, I hope that it will it will be out there as a gift to your grandchildren. Climate change is certainly not going away. Um, I may find a way to to release stories a little bit at a time. Um, we'll see. Um, and and I'm learning how to collaborate with others now to get work done faster. Um, I'm also currently working on a TV project about when the Ku Klux Klan went after Vietnamese fishermen in Texas in. Uh, in the early 1980s. Um, so uh, hopefully, hopefully, fingers crossed, that'll be a thing too. Scanning the side here for more questions. see um you mentioned being in the classroom perhaps the sharing of your story is another way of moving important lessons out of the classroom into a larger audience when i return to my classroom tomorrow what message might you like to give the students about activism as young people any words of encouragement oh that's so great first of all thank you to the teachers that are out there um uh, gosh uh what message might I like to give to the students about activism as young people? It matters. <laughs> it really matters. Um, I think it can be very easy to feel overwhelmed by current events, um, and especially when you pay attention. Um, but you know, and sometimes it does feel like the world is ending, right? Uh, we've been through a lot in the last few years, but I think that if the world is indeed ending, or this is like, this is bad times, there's nowhere I would rather be than with people who are trying to do something about it. That is uh, the thing that I take heart in, is taking action, um, figuring out who is taking action, under trying to understand your own capacity and how you can help where can your gifts and your um, abilities find a place to help advance a common cause? And I really think that the future is in humanity learning to work together rather than fighting each other for scraps. We need to unite around the common issues that affect us all. Um, we do need to pace ourselves, but we, do, we need to find our power in each other and, and, and work towards community. Um, and that's where I hope that, you know, books like this, events like this, build first our empathy for one another, um, help us see 
our commonalities more than our differences, but also learn, help us learn to respect our differences as well so that we don't erase anybody's experiences. And for the young folks, just hang on, hang on to your, your moral compass. The world gets more complicated. Everything gets more, less black and white and more gray areas as you get older, but just to hang on to what you believe is right and fight for that. I wish that this could have been an in-person event. One of the ways that um, I replenish my cup when I feel exhausted is um, just talking to people and learning about them. Um, so I thank you for listening uh, to me. I wish I could be there to listen to you. Um, thank you for your questions, your comments, and uh, thank you for reading. I hope you keep finding uh, books to inspire you. Thank you again to the organizers of this event.